Okay, so hi everyone. Uh, welcome. I'm a pediatric intensivist, and this is a bunch of uh, scenarios of uh, both cardiac and non cardiac conditions that we encounter in the, um, uh, in the um, ICU. So, some of them you will be familiar with. We start off with a child post cardiac um, surgery, a 10 year old who's 25 kg, has had a very prolonged bypass, and um, it's uh, been on high inotropic and vasopressive support, and he's in a low cardiac output state. After two days, uh, his urine output is just picking up, but it's only about 150 ml in the last 24 hours. So his um, creatinine at 48 hours is 1. Pre-op, it was 0.5. So um, I'm not sure why these. So uh, what 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 is the what stage of renal dysfunction is he in now? Did you get the question? So that and the renal failure is now categorized by something called acute kidney injury. So what stage of acute kidney injury is this patient in now? You have the information is mainly based on urine output and change in serum creatinine. Anybody want to volunteer? Okay, so uh, the answer is in the next slide. I'm not sure why it's moving like this. Yeah, so you can see here that uh, um, Sorry, I'm not sure what's happening. Uh, so um, the uh, this is okay. So um, Dr. Prabhat Kumar has said stage three, and that's right. Uh, you need to calculate the creatinine clearance, which is based on length and rise in serum creatinine, and also look at the urine output. So this patient has less than 0.3 ml per kg per hour, and his Creatinine clearance has decreased by 75%. So, I mean, it's decreased by 50%. So it come in actually stage two, right? That means the injury score, right? Right, okay, everybody? Stage two. Okay, so we'll go to the next one. A seven-year-old hyperactive child has been brought to the emergency room with seizures, rapid breathing, and low uh, level of consciousness. He's got no fever or anything suggesting an infective process. His heart rate is 130. His pulses are palpable but irregular. Uh, his blood pressure is 90 and 60. Uh, respiratory system is clear. He's flushed with pupils mid-dilated but reacting. So he was found unconscious by his mother two hours before while he was playing with his grandmother's drug box, which is now empty. And his cardiac monitor is showing a very irregular um, ECG, which is shown below. Yeah, that's his ECG, right? So what do you see? Anything in particular, anybody? It's not terribly irregular, but the QRS, what do you think about the QRS? It's a bit wide. So um, he's got a broad complex tachycardia and is probably an anti, um, anti-depressant, anti-tricyclic, tricyclic, uh, uh, tricyclic uh, um, antidepressant toxicity. So what is the antidote for this? What is the antidote for a tricyclic antidepressant toxicity? The best and easily available antidote, available in every ward and every hospital, however remote. It's actually sodium bicarbonate. 
So it's actually a sodium bicarbonate is the it's uh, easily available cheap um, antidote, and um, it's uh, you need to target both the pH and a normal looking QRS duration as well as normal blood pressure. So you need to remember that it's it's it can children can present with this kind of uh, poisoning and it has to be recognized and it can be very easily treated. Although the uh, overdose is very severe, it can be fatal. Okay, so this will be easy for you guys. This is a 10 year old boy, 10 day old boy with increasing respiratory distress for three days and he's getting dusky during feeds. His heart rate is 140, he's breathing at 65, blood pressure is normal, he's afebrile. He's uh, sinus with rapid shallow breathing with grunting and retraction. There's a uh, grade two systolic murmur along the parasonal border and liver's palpable. Pulses are equal in all four extremities, but the stats are 85 with no uh, improvement with oxygen. That's his chest X-ray. So what's going on? What do you think the diagnosis is? Yes, very good. So it's a so it's a, a so TAPVC. That's a, why do you think the CVP is so high? It volume overload or more likely reflecting right heart, uh, right heart failure. So, okay, okay. So this is a little bit of more ICU kind of uh, scenario. A two-year-old who is admitted in another hospital. His PCO2s are persistently high. Right, and um, this is the this is his flow volume loop. So that's it phase of inspiration above the baseline and that's the phase of expiration below the baseline. The expiratory phase is getting prematurely terminated. So this is a child who's been intubated and his PCO2s are high and this is the flow volume loop. What do you think, what will you suspect? What is the commonest cause of this kind of flow volume loop? So this looks as if he's got a very large leak. Um, it's either a small size tube or wrongly placed, or the tube is appropriate size, but there's a leak in the tubing somewhere. Um, so you need to identify the site of leak, uh, plug it if possible, otherwise change the tube, right? So it's not really air leak syndrome. Air leak syndrome generally refers to uh, like a pneumothorax or anything like that because of high ventilator pressures. This is a leak in the circuit. So that we can't ventilate the patient because there's a leak in the circuit, right? Okay, this child is a uh, um, two-day history with, uh, two-day, two-year-old with his fever for two days, altered metal status, and this is an EG and there's something wrong with the MRI. So it's useful to identify because this MRI change and EEG are both typical of herpes encephalitis. So it's called PLEDS. PLEDS means paroxysmal lateralizing epileptiform discharge. It just means focal seizures occurring in either one or both temporal lobes. Definitive treatment is acyclovir and we can diagnose by a PCR, right? Okay, so you might be, uh, if, uh, sometimes we call our cardiology colleagues for help with this kind of situation when a patient is in severe shock. So a 12 year old with severe dengue has been afebrile for the last two days. He's received a lot of fluid in the initial period of resuscitation. He's very, very edematous and has a total positive balance of two liters. His upper limb pulses are well felt, but lower limb pulses are not very good. 
his capillary refill is prolonged and his urine output is low. Currently, his hematocrit is 37, so the uh, elevated um, hemoconcentration and hypovolemia has settled. So what do you think is going on and how will you manage? So he certainly has severe dengue, but what is the cause of shock at the moment? The hematocrit has improved, so it's not capillary leak. Why is he still in shock? So well, the clue is the fact that he's very, very positive. There's a large fluid balance, and that fluid is not coming out to sting within his body. So it accumulates in various compartments. It can accumulate in the lungs and cause uh, pleural effusions and, and uh, hypoxemia. If it accumulates in the abdomen, what is it called? If it accumulates in the abdomen, it's called um, intra-abdominal hypertension. And if that accumulation is causing uh, renal problems, low urine output, hypoxemia, shock or acidosis, it is called as abdominal compartment syndrome, right? Well, abdominal out of compartment syndrome. So it's not the DSS initial phase causing low urine output. We need to measure the intra-abdominal pressure via the Foley's catheter. And if it is more than 10 millimeters mercury or, I mean, 10 centimeters of water or 100 millimeters mercury, we need to drain, restrict fluid, and start uh, diuretic. So you're right, he does have ascites, but the ascites is causing increased abdominal pressures, pressing on the abdominal, on the uh, renal vessels, and causing low urine output, pressing upwards on the diaphragm, and causing hypoxemia, right? Okay, so this patient has uh, come back from cardiac surgery and has had an arrest. This is an ETCO2 trace uh, that you can see on the monitor. What do you think is happening and what intervention can be done? This child's pulses are poor. What do you think? Any clue from the um, uh, ETCO2? The trace is... If a tube block, you won't get a, 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 a trace at all. You won't get a, a trace at all. The, what is actually the actual capnogram is, come, is decreasing in amplitude. Okay, so um, it just means that the patients, uh, the ETCO2 is not just an indicator of ventilation. It also gives you an idea about cardiac output and is also a good indicator of recovery from a cardiac arrest. So when you see the trace, the value which is going down, you also have to think apart from ventilation that the cardiac output may be low. If the child is getting cardiac massage, uh, maybe the, the operator is tiring or the technique is not good, and that's why you have a poor output. So ETCO2 should be taken in the context of just not gas exchange and ventilation, but also as an in indicator of um, cardiac output and a very good indicator of uh, recovery of the cardiac arrest, also known as return of spontaneous ventilation. Okay, so... Um, A 10-year-old patient is presented with a sudden onset of abdominal pain since the morning, followed by ptosis, right? So, so he's very well, suddenly has abdominal pain and ptosis, and brought to the emergency room with complete apnea requiring intubation. On examination, he has no spontaneous breathing and cough or cough reflex, but the EEG is completely normal. What do you think the diagnosis is? And what, how can we try and treat him? It's looking almost as though he's 
brain death. He's got no spontaneous breathing, no cough reflex, but the EEG is normal. So this a neurotoxic snake bite can cause an, a, a condition which is very, very similar to snake bite. So that's why where one of the um, criteria and, um, and uh, safety aspects of brain death testing is to rule out reversible causes. So generally, if you have a sudden onset of weakness and ptosis, then look for snake fang marks. It can also be a sign of botulism, toxicity, but it won't happen so suddenly. So if it happens so suddenly, so suddenly uh, it, it can be an, uh, due to neurotoxic snake bite and anti-snake venom can be life-saving, right? So this is a scenario of a patient who's been ventilated for lung disease for seven days, right? At the time of ventilation, he was in very high settings. Can easily happen even in the cardiac ICU. Quite high settings, so required sedation and muscle relaxants. Then his lung got better and he was extubated. <clears throat> but following extubation, he had continuous fever, of tachycardia, hypertension, tremors, and diarrhea. So for the fever and tachycardia, all the infection biomarkers such as CRP and procalcitonin were done, which are normal, and his blood culture is sterile. So what do you think is causing this problem? Very good. So it's a withdrawal syn uh, syndrome. So the usual drugs that we use to um, uh, sedate the patient, such as Midazolam and opioids, fentanyl. When they are withdrawn suddenly, they can you, uh, patients can have withdrawal, and sometimes a high-grade fever and tachycardia can fool everyone, thinking it's an infective process. They'll have many causes of, tachy, of uh, antibiotics without getting better. So the clue is the fact that there's tremors, diarrhea as well, and uh, a long course of sedation. So what will be the treatment? Opioid withdrawal or benzodiazepine withdrawal. Anybody for treatment? Okay, so um, you can use so it's, uh, you use a, it's just like a drug addict. You can't uh, suddenly switch them off. So these patients, instead of IV morphine or IV fentanyl, you can put them on. Equivalent doses of oral morphine, even uh, drugs like clonidine can be very useful. And uh, fever spikes and jitteriness and diarrhea can dramatically get better with this. Okay, so now uh, it's all mixed up the questions, so we're back to some renal failure. So match the, uh, match the disease with RRT means renal replacement therapy. So there are several modalities for renal replacement. IHD is intermittent hemodialysis. BD is peritoneal dialysis. CRRT is continuous renal replacement therapy. And um, SLED is slow extended uh, 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 daily dialysis. So with for septic shock with oliguric um, uh, renal failure and fluid overload, which is the best modality for neonate with post CPB, which is the best. So number one, which is the best modality? So number one, PD works well, but if we can, we usually do a CRRT. A neonate after cardiopulmonary bypass. So PD is right. Everybody likes peritoneal dialysis very much. Severe dengue with renal failure, uh, renal failure. remember that uh, we have to be very careful with fluid removal in these patients. Which, which modality will work well? SLED, excellent. SLED is a good modality. What about a chronic renal failure? Hemodialysis. So the problem with hemodialysis is very cheap easily available, but it causes uh, a reasonably rapid fluid shift 
and causes some hemodynamic instability. So it may not be appropriate in patients with hemodynamic issues or patients who have just recovered. So it's, it works very well for chronic conditions. Right. SLED is actually a form of intermittent hemodialysis, but it's very slow. It's a slow form of intermittent hemodialysis, and it combines the best of both CRRT and hemodialysis, and it's gradually coming into ICU stable. And it's especially attractive because it's much cheaper, requires less of anticoagulation, and causes less of hypothermia. Okay, so this is, um, I hope the video works. This is an eight month old referred with a two day history of fever, unresponsiveness, and intermittent seizures. The smear is positive for malaria, and treatment has been commenced. Um, now, seizures are controlled with medication, right? What is happening to this patient? What is happening to this patient? He's got strider, but what might be the cause? So you can see here GCS is low. So strider is caused by upper airway obstruction, but why should a child with cerebral malaria have strider? So this is called neurogenic strider. So whenever a patient with decreased mental status, very good, somebody has said neurogenic. Whenever a patient with uh, decreased mental status, decreased conscious level has strider, it's called neurogenic. And the main cause is what? of the strider, what is causing the obstruction? In, neuro, in the setting of neurogenic strider, what is causing the obstruction? So the cause of obstruction is the soft tissues of the, of the mouth, the tongue, everything falling back and um, obstructing the airway. So how do we treat, how do we manage this? How do we, uh, you've said that all of you are, yeah, okay, <clears throat> prone nursing, anything else? CPAP, CPAP may be useful. So to, to confirm uh, uh, your diagnosis and whether CPAP will be useful, uh, what you need to do is first position the airway. Okay, so you can see here the same patient, that's tr there is some retractions, but the sound is less. You're now lifting up the soft tissues from the airway, and uh, and uh, the obstruction has been relieved. So for this patient, what will you do? Nasopharyngeal CPAP, or you can just put in just an oral nasopharyngeal airway, right? If he needs an, if the uh, strider persists despite a nasopharyngeal airway, you might need to consider intubation. So CPAP may work well, but if a child with decreased mental status it is safer to protect the airway and prevent aspiration and intubate the patient, right? So in the first step, if the GCS is above 10 or 11, you can consider a nasopharyngeal airway, but if the strider persists or his conscious level is lower, you might need to intubate. So the most important thing to do if you have a patient with decreased conscious level and strider is not give adrenaline, not give nebulization, not give steroids, but just position the airway, open the airway. So opening up the airway, like as is being done here. So you can see here, the, the, there's a head tilt and a chin lift, and this can decrease the strider, right? Okay, so this is a four-year-old with fever and unresponsiveness. His airway is maintained with positioning. His breathing efforts are normal. Circulation is uh, 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 normal, 
but he's not conscious, he's not responding to calls. So what is happening with this child? What is happening with this patient? Could you make it out? I'll play it once more. So this is called non-convulsive seizures. Some patients with seizures may not have the motor activity. They may only have a, a staring look, pupillary abnormality, and a bit of twitching. So these patients should be treated as having proper seizures and given IV lorazepam followed by other uh, second-line anticonvulsants. I think that's the last slide. So we're actually done. Anyone wants to go through any of the previous? Is Kavita there? 